Добрый день. Добрый день. Good afternoon. Should we start? Good afternoon, uh, dear participants. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody joining us uh, today to our meeting. Uh, how contemporary composers uh, have reigned over the Russian theatre. Uh, somebody's uh, sound is on. Uh, could you please mute yourselves? Uh, um, this is part of uh, the Russian case um, program, uh, which was uh, created over 20 years ago to target uh, international festival professionals, program directors, theatre critics, uh, everybody interested in the Russian theatre, those that write about the Russian theatre, on an annual basis, uh, we would uh, see about uh, 30 to 80 representatives of the theatre community here in Moscow. We're able to welcome them for over 30 countries. Uh, this year, as uh, we all know, for, we, were, uh, we had to go online. Marina Davidova selected 25 uh, uh, performances uh, that will be showcased uh, on the Russian case platform uh, to guests registered uh, from different countries. This online format enabled us to reach a wider audience uh, to show our performances. So we have over 400 people registered so far. Starting from yesterday, they have been able to watch performances with English subtitles. Uh, an important part of our Russian um, case uh, program are meetings that are usually held in the first part of the day. Meetings uh, devoted to a whole range uh, of uh, the most relevant topics that have to do with the development of the Russian theatre, the modern tendencies. Uh, and uh, we are sticking to this tradition. We agreed uh, that at 1 p.m. every day from the 1st to the 6th of April, we are going to get together and our Russian case guests uh, will meet uh, via Zoom. Uh, this is exactly what's uh, happening now. We'll meet uh, professionals of the theater, people that will talk about uh, what's uh, currently happening and we will cover all sorts of aspects. Uh, the topics were suggested by Marina Davidova. We discussed them internally. We decided to mobilize a lot of very interesting guests. Uh, we decided that this topic would be very interesting, not just for the international guests uh, to participate in the discussions, uh, but uh, the gold mask uh, made this public. Uh, we have people watching us uh, for YouTube and Facebook, uh, and you can access English interpretation via YouTube as well. For our Russian case guests, so please let remind you about the interpretation. You can enable interpretation into English or Russian by clicking on the little globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen or choosing the right audio channel um, by the uh, stream. Uh, if you are in Zoom, uh, please uh, ask your questions uh, via the chat. Uh, and uh, if you're watching the stream uh, over YouTube or Facebook, you can also send in your questions and uh, oh, the moderator will take care of those. Uh, another important point, uh, after the end of the formal part of our discussion, uh, um, the Q&A sessions, uh, everybody registered uh, from our Russian guests, in the case of uh, guests, uh, will be able to unmute themselves uh, to enable their webcams, and then we'll have a less formal discussion at the very end, about half an hour after the main part. So if you have any questions remaining, or if you want to talk about something more generic, uh, you're welcome to do so at the end. I'm going to pass the floor to Yula uh, Belder, the moderator for our session, uh, the editorial commerce and house uh, journalist, a part of the experts uh, council and the jury of uh, the Gold Mask, uh, a music critic and a music journalist, uh, uh, Yulia. Yulia, hi, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining our session today. Uh, we are going to talk about how contemporary Russian uh, composers uh, have reigned over the Russian theater. I would like to present our participants uh, today. These are the conquerors, uh, our composers, uh, the most active conquerors uh, uh, in this uh, very peaceful 
process. So, although perhaps uh, we will talk about uh, whether it is peaceful, in fact, or not, uh, perhaps uh, there are challenges, uh, complications, and stumbling blocks there as well. So our participants uh, are the leaders uh, of uh, contemporary composer and theater processes, uh, both of them that uh, in Russia are separate, in fact. Uh, the modern Russian uh, composer and theater scenes uh, exist uh, in one mode, uh, and the Russian theater exists in a different uh, mode and evolving very rapidly, unlike uh, uh, the contemporary composing scene, uh, which uh, hasn't been able to enjoy uh, as much uh, attention. Our speakers uh, today are people that have over the last at least decade, uh, or perhaps even longer, maybe even two decades, uh, have completely transformed uh, the Russian composing scene, uh, having completely altered it, uh, transformed it, taken it to a new level. And they're the ones that are changing contemporary theater processes as composers and participants uh, uh, of the theater process. Uh, Sergei Nevsky, an amazing composer, uh, who has received a multiple award at a uh, European uh, competition, a composer whose uh, music uh, has been performed at uh, European festivals, uh, uh, as well as the Russian uh, contemporary groups. And not only uh, he has been uh, present at uh, Russian festivals, his music uh, uh, is always there. He uh, has made music uh, for uh, Kirill Silebrenikov's performances, uh, Marek Gartalov's, uh, and uh, what's important uh, for our talk today, he is a curator of a lot of projects, uh, uh, including a project called Platform uh, in uh, 2011 and 2012. Uh, he curated the music program of the Platform project, uh, uh, which had a key impact on the development of contemporary Russian theater, uh, towards shifting it towards music. Uh, our second participant today, um, Alexei Sumak, uh, a very well-known composer, somebody who has uh, collaborated a lot with theatre directors, continues to do so. He created uh, music for Kirill Celebrenikov's performances, and his music has been performed at European festivals by European um, groups and Russian festivals as well, all across the board. Uh, in 2007, uh, the station uh, opera premiered uh, at the ter Territoria. Right, it was Territory in 2008, so, so thank you. Uh, the Territory Festival is uh, incredibly active as well, trying to merge music and theater and to turn it into an interdisciplinary space. Uh, Alexandra Belus, uh, for one of the leaders of the composing scene uh, and the face of the electric theater, the sound audio uh, face, one of a few musical faces to the electric theater. He's a curator, he's a music leader, music director. Dmitry Kurilansky, who was also going to join us today, uh, but unfortunately he was unable to join. Uh, he will be here in spirit, uh, in heart. So not physically, but mentally, he's uh, definitely with us. Uh, Alexander Belousov, uh, he's a composer. He works both as an author of uh, music, and he's a sound designer. He is the music uh, director for uh, the dramatic performances at the Electric Theatre, and he's also an author of uh, uh, some of the most uh, popular, the most uh, uh, such operas as uh, many Austin's in two parts, uh, um, Single Line, uh, the Book of uh, Seraphim, uh, presented uh, this season as part of uh, the Golden Mask competition. Uh, and among others, Alexander Belosov is the only one among our participants uh, today who does not only have a music background, but uh, he's also um, a director by uh, education. Uh, he graduated uh, as an opera director uh, in Kiev, uh, and he was also a participant uh, to Anatoly Volosivov's uh, lab, uh, his uh, director's uh, labs, and Boris Yohananov's labs. Uh, so these are the participants uh, for today. 
few more words about the overall situation, the overall context uh, that uh, we are in, uh, if we talk about uh, uh, the contemporary Russian drama scene over the last uh, decade, uh, contemporary composing music uh, entered the territory of uh, uh, Russian drama theater, becoming a part of it, uh, not uh, as uh, an addition and not as an uh, not to accompany it, uh, but uh, sometimes uh, music becomes even the foundation, the base uh, of the entire performance. Uh, music is transforming the appearance of the Russian theatre and is changing itself. Uh, we are going to talk about how, under the impact of music, theatre has been evolving and which uh, direction and uh, how does what is this place for music in theatre? Uh, is it uh, trying to find a space because it's uh, losing popularity and demand in music platforms, or is it a completely different kind of activity? This intervention of music into theatre is happening in four directions, as far as I see. This is the work of composers for drama performances. Uh, the foundation of drama is now music. It's a situation whereby we come to a premiere, to a drama performance, a theatre, and then we discuss music after the performance. Uh, it seems to be surprising, but that's a fact. Uh, number two, the second area is uh, this uh, intervention of genres uh, that have traditionally existed uh, in academic music spaces. Uh, uh, for instance, with the drama theater, now uh, it's a place for opera. And these are sometimes uh, some of the most popular premieres in the season. Why does opera exist uh, in the space of the drama theater? The third area is the changes uh, in the relationships uh, between the composers and the directors, uh, who plays the lead role, uh, who plays the you know, secondary role. And uh, we are uh, discovering a phenomenon of the composer's theater when the composer is both uh, the author and the director of the performance. And the, the fourth area is um, a building interdisciplinary, intergenre spaces. Uh, and this is what I would like to start our talk today. Would it be true to say that the new Russian dramatical theater is now an interdisciplinary and intergenre space? Uh, and could you conceive a situation uh, whereby Russian music theater, this traditional Russian music theater, uh, is uh, uh, transforming into a reservation for conservative genres and strategies. So with opera theaters, a stage in opera as opera, ballet as a ballet, and potentially the authors uh, and the audiences are going to stay with the uh, music theaters uh, um, only in their orthodox conservative part uh, and drama theater will turn into an interdisciplinary experimental space. Uh, I'm going to ask Alexei to start us off. Uh, Alexei is uh, the music director of the Praxica Theater. With uh, the new team, it was announced uh, that uh, music is going to be some of one of the leading uh, parts of their activity. Alexei, hi, everyone. I guess so what I would like to start off with is uh, by saying that uh, there have been changes uh, in uh, the way we perceive uh, classical and opera theater. There have been changes uh, both with the creators, the makers of the new performances and the way the audiences have perceived these performances. Uh, I guess I'm going to start uh, from afar. I think to understand the essence of any phenomenon, the root cause of any phenomenon is one of the key goals of art. Uh, it has always been the case. Uh, and uh, the more dynamic the evolution of the contemporary world, uh, the more important this aspect becomes. Uh, this attempt to figure out uh, how the text uh, coexists uh, with music, uh, how this is perceived by the audiences. Uh, this leads uh, to an inevitable change uh, in the perception of the composer and the relationship with the audience. Uh, that's why there has been a significant transformation in the classical and opera theaters. This uh, 
leads me to believe that this uh, resulted in the change uh, in uh, what's currently in demand. If we talk about how this occurs, uh, it's important to think about how composers currently interact with the directors. Uh, I guess it would be easier for me to talk about my operas. Uh, I have six operas, uh, and every time I work on an opera, I reach out to the client, the director of the theater, or the, di the director of the performance, uh, with, uh, with an idea, a concept. Uh, it could be uh, a concept uh, that uh, deals on the interaction between the audiences and the theater. Very often, I come with uh, a prepared scenography for a play. It has to do with the fact that uh, music uh, is uh, intricately interrelated uh, with these two, well, in fact, more aspects. Yulia, uh, at the same time, opera projects, uh, I'll let me explain to our audiences, uh, uh, Alexei, Alexei's uh, uh, plays would be staged uh, both uh, by traditional opera plays like the Perm, Theatre of Opera and Ballet, and he was awarded the Golden Mask uh, for Cantus, uh, and uh, the classical theatre spaces. Uh, so my question would be, what is the difference uh, when you approach these different uh, uh, performances, uh, these different plays, uh, the, the mechanics uh, and the genre differences um, between these uh, projects and these uh, spaces? Uh, is that something that you feel, like say, well, yes, uh, there's an amazing peculiarity. The operas that were staged by classical theaters, uh, they were as opera as possible. And the others uh, that were staged uh, by experimental themes were towards performances, uh, like performative practices, uh, performative arts. And that's easy to explain. It had to do with the fact that uh, I wanted to rethink uh, the interactions with the audiences uh, because I think this is the most complex uh, task uh, that all of the theater creators are currently faced with. Uh, you know, when you come to an opera theater, you expect uh, this bourgeois situation when you sit back, uh, uh, the curtains are drawn and, and, and you, you watch a performance. I never have anything like that. So my audiences always find themselves in very challenging situations. Either they find themselves on uh, the scene and then they're looking back uh, into the audience hall from uh, the stage uh, or they come to uh, a dramatic theater and uh, they are faced with a very unusual space. Uh, I always uh, try to think about how I could avoid uh, stressing the boundaries between the beginning and the end of uh, a performance. Um, I'm trying to blur these boundaries. Uh, I want to create a situation whereby it's never clear whether you are in an opera or a drama space. Let me go back to what I started with. Uh, I guess it has to do with the fact that there is a lot of interest uh, towards the nature of things, the nature of knowledge. Uh, Yuli, both of the creators of the performances and, and the audiences as well. Yuli, uh, the line is breaking a little bit, uh, uh, but if you can hear me again, the question about the audience and the role of the audience uh, and the role of the listener, uh, would it be correct to say that uh, when a play is being staged uh, uh, by a traditional music uh, theater, we by default accept the situation whereby we're dealing with a prepared audience. If they don't have music background, they kind of understand uh, that uh, music uh, is a specific type of art. Uh, they come with this knowledge uh, for the new audience, uh, the, the new audience of the new drama theater, of this interdisciplinary theater. Uh, do they need any music background? As we know, in Russia, uh, 
this is something that's largely a fail. It's not like uh, everybody knows um, how to read notes in Russia. The situation is slightly different in Europe. Uh, how would you approach this? So does the new theatre need a new educated audience? So Alexei, well, you, you know, there's an important uh, uh, phrase by love of that I wanted to share. The evolution of music is not the evolution of style or an evolution of aesthetics. Uh, it's an evolution of the composer's thought. Uh, so to me, it's not so much a question whereby am I in the right aesthetics? Am I going to uh, be in line with the contemporary music aesthetics? Uh, that's not an issue for me. I think uh, music, uh, as Mozart said, it's not just the notes, it's the silence between the notes. Uh, and I think we should be looking for those spaces between the notes. Uh, and uh, for me, it doesn't really matter whether uh, the audience has any music background, or maybe it's best if they don't, uh, so that they can actually listen to what's happening between the notes. And I think that's more critical. Yeah, yeah. okay, between the sounds. Uh, Let's just um, adjust uh, the videos a little bit. Uh, Alexei, could you put, please sit back a little bit so that we can see your face better? But we can hear you perfectly, so that's uh, that's good. Thank you so much. Sergey. on to you. I wanted to ask you the same question. Music uh, between these spaces, how does it exist uh, between sounds and between the traditional music theater and the new uh, Russian uh, drama theater? When you work with the theater as a composer and you work with a, a, a directorial play, like you've been working with Gonzalo for recently, uh, these are drama performances, uh, dramatic plays. Uh, working with contemporary um, playwrights so, or, or even like from uh, previous centuries like Ostrovsky or well contemporary authors uh, when you join these uh, projects as a composer how does it feel do you have to alter your composer thinking perhaps uh, somehow or the technique uh, um, what is your role as you perceive it in the space as a composer in a dramatic space? Sergei, can you hear me? Yes, we can see you, we can hear you. I would add another dimension to the ones you listed. Uh, there is a traditional opera uh, that are staged by traditional opera uh, theatres that don't sing contemporary. I think it, I had a similar situation in Stuttgart when I had to work with uh, like a part of my Boris project uh, uh, where we staged that in parallel with Boris Kodanov. Uh, that's one context. Uh, it's a huge mechanism uh, where composers uh, don't have any impact, in fact, on the process itself. Uh, because uh, it's it's like a movie, it's like a cinema making. Uh, it's a heavily regulated process, and you can't really interfere. Uh, you can't uh, even make any remarks. Like you have to go through uh, a special agent after the rehearsal, having submitted your text. You don't really have an impact on the process. Uh, and then you work with contemporary opera for off spaces, and that happens very often. Uh, whereby you write for a small group uh, and then it will be performed uh, in a small space uh, uh, with a small amount of uh, people present. I'm, I'm working on a project right now for five singers uh, for the Venice uh, Biennale, perhaps we'll then be able to bring it to Moscow. It's a very small like chamber project uh, um, where the composer can offer some ideas in terms of the way we perceive the space, uh, in terms of uh, how the interaction between electronics and regular sound is going to work, or how video is going to be integrated. And then the composer partially becomes a director. And I know a lot of directors uh, you know, today like uh, um, that w they want to do everything. They want to be the director. They want to be the composer. They, they want to play all of the roles, like Evels, uh, uh, for instance. He says, I want to be the author of the performance entirely. 
I don't want to be everything. I, I, I don't feel like I'm a director. I think a director is uh, somebody who brings an, an additional meaning. He's not just in charge of uh, hands-on organization of the space for the actors. So it's always uh, more ideas that the composer might not even have uh, because, well, you're from a different context. And there's a third process, uh, uh, the third uh, dimension is uh, the drama theater for the existence of music uh, and here to me music is uh, the second stenography Fortunately for Russian composers, there isn't much commissioning except uh, dramatic theatre, but uh, uh, all of the best contemporary Russian um, composers are working for the drama theatre, and that's why the theatre is getting really lucky. And if you get happy with uh, the director like uh, Kirill Serebrikov or Dmitry uh, all these amazing directors I've been working with, uh, we are able to work on music not like context-based or situation-based, like I want something gay here, like funny, like uh, sad or slow down but you can have a full-fledged music performance uh, uh, which is added to the scenography to the lights uh, let me give you an example the last play that we had uh, with uh, Murat Gansarev, which is currently being staged in Perm uh, there are video bloggers uh, that talk about the context uh, the, 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 they recount uh, Ostrovsky's plays uh, then uh, the Lyosha Labanov's uh, mm, setting and Alexey Labanov, uh, who comments on what's happening on uh, exclusively using uh, Ostrovsky plays, uh, which are like well-known proverbs in the Russian language now. And it, it's a very strange feeling. It's, it's like an alien element uh, introduced. Uh, uh, it's sort of uh, alluding to Martali, but uh, with every play that we're working on with Gonzalo, we had eight in total. We had 15 projects in total for theater. We try to come up with a different approach, a different twist, uh, like we have Trunks uh, by Verupayev, uh, where there are three orchestras around the audience uh, playing very different tempo music, uh, and this music doesn't stop for two hours. Uh, or we have electronic uh, music uh, for uh, uh, Nancy Lang's uh, with uh, like, like Macmillan, uh, where we are constantly multiplying sounds produced uh, by the actors interacting with odd objects on the stage. So I'm trying every time to come up with a different concept. And of course, uh, uh, the composer's approach to working in opera uh, or like in contemporary opera for a small space is always different. So uh, different conditions, uh, different uh, uh, types of, of, of music. Uh, music, uh, even if it's uh, an equal part of uh, the drama performance, it's never the stem of it. So I don't think uh, dramatic theater is uh, going to be the main refuge for opera. Real opera requires an orchestra. It requires a, a special space. Uh, uh, the, the, even the richest of uh, dramatic theaters uh, don't need that because it's, it's not part of their activities. So you like, well, yes, of course. Uh, Yes, of course, there's always the infrastructure, the technical bits, the, the, the musical instruments, the voices, uh, uh, both for electro theatre and the practical theatre that are actively involved in music. Uh, they, they have their own, of course, uh, but uh, they don't have a symphonic orchestra, of course, uh, and there's no space for it and there's no need for it. Uh, and uh, going back to the audiences again, if the composer changes their tasks, uh, changes their approaches and their solutions, uh, is the director then guided by the composer? Uh, this new dramatic theater, this uh, renewed uh, dramatic theater, uh, does it need a new audience? So do they need a music background? Uh, Sergey Ball back to Perm. I'll give you an example. I had a, a lot of happy experiences there. Corentis, who was uh, the, the, uh, the head of the Perm Opera, uh, he it's now continuous project in St. Petersburg uh, uh, when we was a premier in the violin concert in, in Perm, I met a lot of uh, very advanced people in Perm. Uh, and then uh, later on, uh, when I worked in the theater, I had to personally convince these people that loved opera 
that's uh, the theater theater which to them uh, was something which was like secondary that's also awesome uh, that it's also art and it's also worthy and uh, I brought uh, opera fans uh, uh, there to, to, to listen to music that I wrote for the theater. And I guess, well, when, when you have the same names and you're trying to sort of dilute uh, the borders, uh, audiences are going to migrate and the educated uh, opera lovers uh, will come to dramatic performances and listen to the composer, which is exactly what I see happening with me. Yulia. You said that uh, music in the dramatic theater is rarely the stem of uh, the performance, uh, but sometimes uh, when you perceive it, when you listen to it, uh, when you're there, I don't think that's uh, always the case. Uh, it, it sometimes does feel like uh, the most critical element in the performance. So while I speak is, uh, my, my question is then to Alexander Belousov. Uh, we know of examples uh, whereby composers and dramatic theaters uh, were coming up with the entire text uh, of uh, the the entire scenography of uh, the performance and they are the ones staging it alexander monikoff uh, who uh, recently has been working extensively as a composer and as a director at the same time at a drama theater you know, talking about his uh, play 52 uh, at uh, the big theater and a few seasons ago we were hugely impressed uh, by the Novosibirsk theater performance called the old house i think the, the, the snow maiden by alexander uh, manakov uh, i'm just diverting a little bit alexander i'll get back to the question that i was going to ask you but just this little excursion for our listeners just to set the context a little bit uh, in this opera uh, the human voice uh, did not sound once well maybe once for a couple of seconds uh, uh, and no musical instruments were involved. Uh, there were a lot of like household objects, like spoons and like tin cans and like uh, rattles, whatever. There was there were no words, uh, no lyrics, uh, no voice, uh, practically. But the, the the entire play was put together by the director as as, as a music piece. Uh, and in some of his explanations, in some of his interviews, uh, uh, he was talking about uh, the fact that uh, the entire um, play needs to be put together as a, 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 a music piece uh, and then the, the as, a, as a score. Uh, another question to you, um, Alexander, I remember one of the critics said that uh, um, a performance, a play is uh, a, a chain of transformation. So you come up with a libretto, then the, this libretto is transformed into a music text, and then the next uh, link in the chain is transformed into a, a scenography, and then we can go on. Uh, the scenography is transformed into the text uh, that exists uh, as it's perceived by the audience. Uh, uh, and all this of this happening with the mutual consent of all of the parties involved. When you are the maker, the creative libretto of the, the music text and the scene text, who takes the lead uh, when you act in these three entities, uh, the composer, the, the maker, and the director, when you work on the uh, scenography score? It's a very interesting question. So, so you start with the concept of the, the very uh, initial um, link in this chain. Uh, I get the concept. Um, the the Omnium says, then they, I involved uh, a libretto author who wrote, wrote uh, the, the libretto, developed the characters. Uh, and then we worked with the libretto. I came up with the music. Uh, who takes the lead? Mm, that's a hard question. Uh, of course, the concept uh, came to me as a composer, somebody who understood that I need to write an opera, that it's something I want to do. And I had this urge, this intention. And in this respect, I was looking for a libretto, and that's how this uh, project came about. But when we worked on the music itself, uh, because to a certain extent, I am a director, it was interesting for me 
Well, I can't really answer your question. Nobody can answer this kind of question. Uh, who takes the lead when? Who makes the decision? Who decides to make this music move or another music move? Uh, uh, very often, the director is very actively involved in these decisions. Uh, they understand that uh, scenic uh, time is limited. Uh, and those are the constraints and uh, music time has other types of constraints uh, and we need to strike a balance uh, navigating between these uh, two uh, universes and to, it's sort of reconciled within me but well that that would be my answer to your question when i work uh, on the score I know what it's going to look like on the stage as a director. Looking back at my first experience, Miniasis Part 1, I didn't know what the scenography is going to look like, but I, I knew more or less uh, what it's going to look like on stage. If the spatial um, concept changed, uh, perhaps, uh, but the actions, the these uh, balances uh, it was something that i had visibility of from the very beginning as a director perhaps more well it's hard to say really <laughs> yulia the, the scenography was done by uh, stepan lukyanov uh, alexander yes stepan lukyanov well jointly we did it in fact uh, i was actively engaged in the process myself uh, well just the way it worked out so once you know the what the scenography is going to no, like you know how to stage things, so how to introduce access. It, it's a symbiotic process, I would say. Yulia, when you work um, as an author, um, uh, when you are like uh, in these uh, three entities in one, essentially, you 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 are looking at uh, uh, the stage itself, the electric theatre, all of these uh, scenic limitations where Arena Sverio works. Uh, and her um, amazing vocal performance. Uh, if you had the opportunity and the interest in to uh, stage for the big opera theater or in a completely different off scene uh, where you would be inviting the performance yourself, so this um, composers and directors thinking, would it change? Uh, depending on the space itself and the constraints of the space itself, uh, and we talked about this with Sergei a little bit. Alexander, well, the big opera theater is a completely different type of uh, musical language, if you will, and this uh, the correlation between the music uh, and uh, the staging, well, because it's an opera of, I don't know, high-class opera, like you're a business class opera, right? Uh, Alexander, well, yes, it's a, it's a vocal painting, if if you will. Things that we can allow ourselves on the smaller stage with the electric theatre, working with um, nobody pretending to be opera celebrities. Uh, Yulia, well, they are celebrities, aren't they? Alexander, well, they are celebrities, but in a very specific niche. What I'm interested in is this more in-depth uh, work with dialogues and the, uh, and the musical text uh, we come up with uh, whenever there's an opportunity to hold a conversation in an opera theater. This is uh, hard to conceive. It could be an episode in an opera performance, uh, like a little intermission, where you could have a very intense dialogue that would be similar to a dramatic dialogue. Uh, in this sense, it's a completely different uh, type. A big opera is more like a movie. It's more of a cinematic experience. Um, Yulia, when you work as a composer or a sound designer for uh, a drama theater with another director, not uh, with your opera or your performance, uh, uh, when you are guided by uh, some um, playwright text, uh, are you faced with other sorts of tasks uh, or does music uh, continue to be uh, 
an active participant uh, on par, not uh, subordinate. Uh, Alexander, we're looking at my experience working with drama theater. It sort of works out that I'm not working with uh, um, celebrity directors usually. I was always on par. I always held an on par dialogue with all of the directors uh, because I do have some uh, uh, directorial background and the directors uh, feel that. Uh, when they invite me, well, that's the way I think it. I, I'm going to be actively coming up with concepts or proposals. So I don't want to destroy like the, the initial concept of the director. We just need to uh, find points of contact. So I just expect them to trust me in this respect. So, and it all even works out like during the rehearsal, I'm working in parallel with the music and I, I come up with proposals so, and uh, well, like they can't really alter it. So, just because of like my way of working, this is when I can feel their intent uh, and they are open to accept my proposal. So I guess I'm more active than other composers that might be working with the theater, waiting for my cues or like detailed instructions from the director, something like that. So there's, a, there's an argument in the chat uh, evolving, like in terms of what we saw before. We're talking about how this invasion of composers uh, uh, into the territory of the drama theater has transformed it. Uh, but uh, one of our participants, uh, one of our guests, uh, was talking about uh, Vladimir Pankov, reminded us of him uh, and the sound drama project. Uh, not so much the composers, so like, like an interdisciplinary area. I don't think I'm going to be able to navigate you through the dates in terms of what was before. Uh, was that uh, our uh, participants in the drama theater or the first sound dramas by uh, Bankov? I thought these two processes were involved and in parallel simultaneously. Are just the composers are changing the drama theater towards a, a music transformation? And uh, Alexei Simak said that even before that, we had Richard Wagner. Alexei, could you develop on your point? <laughs> Alexei, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I think the main component um, of um, drama theater in terms of uh, integrating uh, music. Uh, and drama, the key role is uh, played by the composers. Uh, now I'm thinking back uh, to um, Monteverdi has, he called it uh, the, the theater madrigal. All of the researchers, and you, you might know this, uh, they, 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 they don't really know what it is. Uh, it's not really opera. It's, it's, it's some kind of uh, a theater performance where the narration is sung. Uh, but there is a, some important dramatic action ongoing at the same time. With Wagner, I always had this feeling that uh, it's, a, it's a drama play. And he made drama actors sing opera. And uh, uh, Wagner's operas are all like that, so with uh, rare exceptions. Yuli, uh, so now following Wagner and Monteverdi and Pankov and each other, we are moving towards uh, uh, the so-called uh, merged art. Uh, but uh, what is the difference uh, from uh, Wagner times? Uh, and uh, is uh, new Russian drama theater and new composer music uh, are creating a completely new, not very expected, dimension and how would we expect it to evolve uh, going forward uh, i'll say i think the contemporary theater um 19th century and even before that uh, is offering a more in-depth uh, analysis of the nature of music, the nature of speech, the nature of perception, uh, the nature of uh, textual perception, meaning perception. Mm -hmm. 
познание, наверное. It's this exploratory attempt that uh, um, is behind all of these transformations, uh, Sergey. Which direction is this dimension evolving in? Are we actually seeing this space as something new, something that stands out, or something that's uh, uh, different from anything that happened before? I have these two dimensions that I was talking about, the traditional musical theater and new drama theater. You've added this off scene where music uh, can exist uh, separately from these more traditional institutions, uh, but that's the European uh, situation. So off scene is not something that's developed in Russia. Nevsky, well, Electra Theater, 200 people in the audience, that's not a 1,400 people. It's a small experimental space, uh, like the, the Golden Axe or Orpheus. Uh, well, th this is an experimental space uh, where music uh, justifies the existence of uh, directorial art. Uh, but uh, going back to the genealogy in Pankov, uh, there is, in fact, a rich tradition in the European theater whereby music uh, is more than just uh, music for a play, starting from epic theater, Brecht's uh, epic theater, you know, where uh, Kurt Wally is, uh, uh, you, you can't change a single note uh, or a single uh, uh, instrument. Uh, you'll have uh, his, uh, or when Kirill Serbikov invited the initial contemporary uh, uh, composers, so like Matsky, then me, then Alexei uh, Simak, uh, Kishi, this uh, amazing play by Serebrinikov, it's 50% music, uh, uh, which was uh, written and played by professionals. Uh, it was uh, looking at Lubimov, uh, when Lubimov uh, uh, invited Schnitke and Denisov uh, in Lubimov's plays. Uh, it's more than just a music for a play, because uh, when Lubimov uh, was partnering with La Scala, Lucinona, they had uh, on par interactions. Uh, it was a director uh, in an opera context, in a La Scala context, uh, a director and a composer, they were on par, they were co-creators. Uh, and of course, we have this experience uh, from the 90s when Anatoly Vasiliev uh, was working with Martinov, uh, um, and uh, and they were putting together. It, it is quite unclear there what, what came first, uh, the theater or music uh, uh, or, or, or the choir, which is also a main character in the performance. There is this rich tradition and uh, and Cortali in the European tradition, he's a musician himself uh, who creates music and makes music uh, the main character starting from uh, uh, Mopus European, based on uh, patriotic German songs uh, and uh, this whole German layer of culture uh, that used uh, Schubert as a source of inspiration. Uh, this is uh, examples, so there's Bob Wilson as well, where music and uh, theatre coexists, uh, but usually for him music is subordinate nonetheless. Uh, um, but the, he was working with Tom Waits, uh, he was uh, he, he was working with very different people and uh, Looking into these uh, possibilities of horizontal interactions uh, between the composer and the director. So when you say that, uh, like uh, Monteverdi, Alexei is right. So if we want to see that music is uh, the, the source, so then perhaps that's the, that's the that's the source uh, when uh, of this phenomenon uh, when uh, the composer and the director are equal co-creators. Uh, Yuli, let's stop here for a second. Thank you so much uh, uh, for this uh, very extensive genealogy. Uh, we're talking about Mayor Hold now in the chat. Uh, there's a million other examples that can be cited. Uh, some of the plays by Anatoly Vasiliev uh, that you just quoted uh, uh, and uh, his work with uh, Martinov. Uh, but some of the non-musical uh, plays by Vasiliev, uh, the way I Think about them, they, they do sound musical. They, they sound like a, a, a sound score, a musical score. But the reason I wanted to stop you here, you said that music and theater exist on par. And one of our participants is saying that if you ask a musician, uh, to them, music always comes first. Uh, if you ask a director, to them, the, the play, the staging comes first. What do you think? You think that's not the case? So again, it depends on the context. Uh, 
I think, uh, well, when I was working with Gonzalo, the reason that we were successful working together, we were coming up with a concept together. And uh, very often it starts with the scenography. Um, that's that's the base, uh, that's the springboard for us. Uh, there's always this uh, uh, super idea, a uh, musical super idea superimposed over the, the initial theater concepts and working together, uh, it's a very productive horizontal synergy I think it's, it's a very lucky situation that we were in, but I don't think it's very common. Usually somebody dominates, so like a director would dominate or an opera. The, well, I think even directors dominate an opera now. I don't think composers have uh, um, a lot of impact on the end opera product uh, because uh, the place of the director in the big opera is a big, it's a big business uh, and it's very limited. Uh, uh, you've wrote the score and that, that's it, you're, you're free to go. And uh, there's a huge team that uh, takes it on uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, people in, in charge of the stage. Like, even with the lecture theatre, when we were working on the Galileo project, uh, we couldn't have any impact uh, on what Yohananov was doing. Uh, we just needed to accept it as, as a part of life, that's it. Uh, Yulia, looking into the future, oh, we've been reminded about the antique times in the chat. Uh, this is there's a lot of uh, like uh, historical recapping today. One of the assumptions, uh, conquering the drama theater by the composers. Uh, perhaps there is a, an intuitive going back to the roots, to the base. Sergei, definitely, yes, absolutely. When I was working uh, with the choir, I was reading Aristotle and I discovered that I was fully aligned with uh, his principles of when the choir you know, participates, which parts of the, I did exactly what I was supposed to do by Aristotle. Winston said the theater was happy and unified before it was separated into drama theater, music theater and choreography, etc. Uh, the golden age was when it was unified. Uh, Alexei, Alexander, what do you think about going back to the roots? Uh, what roots are you going back to in uh, uh, your composer uh, activities uh, in the traditional uh, drama or opera theaters or off scene or any other festival spaces or the, the, the practical theater or the electric theater? Let's talk about the roots. Uh, Alexei, if we don't look at the external aspects, if we go back to the antique times, to the myths, uh, Aside what Sergei just mentioned, uh, what's important for me is this uh, unified nature of uh, theater where there is no separation into music or action or uh, acting. I think that's what I'm most concerned by, and this is the cornerstone of all of my musical explorations. Uh, It's important uh, how the nature of perception changed uh, with uh, contemporary theater. I'm absolutely convinced uh, that uh, theater is evolving more and more uh, towards uh, a dramatic statement uh, versus a mythological statement. Uh, and uh, this uh, leads to a change in the entire construct of uh, the play. It was a good question. To, to what extent uh, this uh, fragmented theatre tendency is uh, a part of this uh, music trend? Uh, if we talk about the mythologization of the theatre space, there are two tendencies that emerge. On the one hand, the theatre and the statement itself becomes discrete, uh, fragmented. On the other uh, hand, uh, time is becoming less important uh, versus what we saw at the in the 20th or the, the 19th centuries. Yulia, thank you. Alexander, what roots are we coming back to? And are we coming back to the roots uh, when we dissolve these oppositions, uh, partitions between drama and musical theatres? Uh, just a small remark from me on antique theatres. Uh, 
they never spoke there. If you think that dramatic theatre is where there is a, uh, there are actors speaking versus a music theatre where actors are singing, then antique theatre, as uh, we understand, they always would be singing, not speaking. Not uh, it was a tragedy or comedy, not drama. But for comedies, they might be talking, but usually it, it was uh, singing. They're talking about the syncretic unity of uh, music uh, and acting. One small uh, remark. Uh, talking about uh, operas, uh, composers, uh, librettos, etc. The first director uh, of the libretto is the composer because they are the first to interpret uh, the text. Uh, they are already proposing an approach to the director, and then it's up to the director to recreate it on the stage. Uh, of course, they can omit scenes, etc., because, of, well, the ethical responsibility for the performance is uh, held by the director. At least that's the way I see it. Uh, usually, directors are the ones that are organizing and ensuring that the performance can go on and can exist. So they are the ones um, taking the final decision. So, but the composer, when they pitch the music as a, as a proposal, they already come in with their own interpretation. They have already at that point interpreted the text as a director. And then, well, the, the director takes it on. Yulia, apologies. Yes, go on, please. Uh, go ahead. Alexander, the question was about what routes we're coming back to. Another idea, well, types of art, uh, as, as we see from uh, uh, practice, uh, they are moving and evolving in parallel, and some of them, uh, they, they, they get ahead, and others are playing catch up. Uh, uh, beginning of the 20th century, Mayor Hald, uh, and then you had, the, like, in terms of scenography, you didn't have anything, and then you had Tatler, then you start to work with the space, etc. In this respect, the way music is uh, currently entering or has entered the theater dimension, uh, well, music directors are usually not very educated people in the majority. Sometimes uh, they understand that uh, music is something that's very relevant and interesting, and uh, they engage an expert, uh, somebody they consider to be an expert, uh, like uh, Syria Brunikov uh, engaged uh, Sergei Nevsky at some point and did the right thing. Uh, and uh, uh, like say we've got Boris Yukhananov engaged uh, uh, Kurlansky and uh, when they understand that this is the right moment uh, to engage advanced musicians into theater practices uh, they, they make the step uh, currently we're in a situation whereby theater has advanced uh, uh, having engaged these musicians uh, that have brought their thinking, not just uh, in terms of uh, audio organization and uh, silences, etc., just to the way of thinking, their approach, their approach to structuring the text. Uh, very often I would come up against the fact that uh, Kurlansky ideas uh, found their way into the, the play, not like his ideas, but the, the director's ideas. Uh, so just the way of thinking is critical. And now I think they're aligned uh, and what's going to happen next. Well, hard to say. We will be digging deep, I think. Uh, Yulia, well, talking about the future, I think it's important to talk about it. Uh, but just for just a brief second, let me interrupt you. Let me stop our discussion. Let's turn to the chat. Uh, I'm talking about music uh, being an abstract category, an abstract art, uh, as far as I, I understand. Uh, and possibly music, as our participants write, uh, uh, can talk about uh, important issues of freer, uh, things that cannot be described in words, uh, or at least uh, music is not subject to censorship. You can talk about uh, things that are not conventional or things that are perhaps uh, uh, censored. And by uh, this uh, synergetically accompanying each other, uh, perhaps uh, we're able to combat censorship, uh, these two forms of art. Uh, if we take our roots in the antique times, do we want to go back to the antique times? Uh, do we want to live in the antique times today? And if we do want that, is that doable? We still have to live in the contemporary times. So 
And Sergei Nevsky reminded us that we forgot another person uh, in all of these uh, chains of composers, uh, directors, and performance. You also have the conductors. Uh, the conductor decides, Sergei, the conductor decides. Sergei, it wasn't me who said that. Uh, it was a comment uh, uh, from uh, Olga Alexandrova. She wrote in the in, in the opera houses, conductors often decide, uh, and she's right in this respect uh, because uh, the conductor is the advocate of uh, of uh, uh, the composer in the face of the madness of the director. Sergey, well. It's important to uh, find uh, some kind of sound balance. They won't be the prosecutor. I have this amazing experience uh, working in the big theater. There was a uh, Victor Tricard, it's absolutely genius scenography with one problem. Uh, the orchestra is uh, on the second uh, stage and faced uh, with their backs to um, the, the audience, uh, so singers uh, have uh, no contact uh, with the conductor. It's all done by the monitor. I don't know how they survive this, uh, but the sonographer just forgot that the singers need to see the conductor. Uh, it happens. Uh, Yulia, well, it was absolutely beautiful, Sergey. It is absolutely beautiful, and they managed uh, the Francesc, a uh, part of the opera group uh, project. Uh, an amazing project uh, which had a significant impact on uh, developing theater. Apologies for interrupting you, just for our Vasily Barkhatov uh, was uh, the, the director. Uh, new scores uh, were commissioned uh, to uh, a number of composers, living composers both in Russia and abroad, uh, and uh, uh, staged uh, using traditional theater platforms at the Stanislavski Theater. I don't remember where else. Uh, it was uh, uh, Liva and Langer, um, Horbach, uh, the big theater. And then uh, it went downhill from there, as usual. The Francis Serginevsky's opera, it, it, be, it was, uh, what did the Golden Mask get, got the special prize? Um, uh, Sergey, to, to conclude the thought, uh, the, the director is the moderator between, uh, well, the conductor is the moderator between the uh, the director and uh, the conductor. If there's something that's distorting the, the audio uh, universe, like uh, the, 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 the choir is stamping on stage, or in Stuttgart, I had this episode uh, when the choir uh, had plastic bottles that they were holding and they were making noise, and, and then we had to there was a whole trade union meeting to address this, uh, like everybody got together uh, and the director of the theater would moderate all of this. Uh, and there are always conflict situations that emerge uh, where the composer doesn't have an impact. It just needs to take a step back, hide and crawl out only once it's over because, well, it's out of your hands. Uh, this is way beyond our realm of responsibility and competencies. Uh, uh, for smaller scale projects, of course, the composer does have a voice. They can say something, but not always. Uh, uh, for instance, when we had the Galileo project, Yukhananov uh, uh, at the Electric Theatre really wanted uh, uh, for the reader, the mathematician, to be talking over our violin or music. Uh, and I asked them not to do that. Uh, and Pavel Karmanov, who's also engaged in the projects, we, we, well, uh, we wrote together two minutes of extra music uh, that this person could talk over, not the actual piece. And I said, well, talk here, and then no, shut up. Uh, Yelia, OK, well, so because it was like a conflict situation. Uh, electric theater is very small, in fact. Uh, and. Uh, uh, that's where you can possibly say something. But when it's a huge theater monster, then the composer doesn't really have a say. It happens as well. You'll uh, some more curious elements that have to do with the project, so with the, the uh, operas uh, written by several... Uh, it was an opera for, for a scientist, right? Uh, it was a collective opera. Uh, that's curious. Uh, this uh, staging was a, a co-production between the Electric uh, Theatre and the Polytechnic Museum, which is uh, very interesting in itself uh, for contemporary theatre, both music and drama theatre. 
it was a stepping beyond the boundaries of Sergei. Well, we had other co-productions as well with the Hermitage uh, Museum, uh, Vladimir Anyev's uh, opera with the uh, pre-gift texts uh, staged uh, in Glavstab. This uh, composers coming to these theatres uh, also triggers, uh, well, not among other factors, uh, theatres to step beyond uh, uh, theatre spaces to reach out to museums, uh, both contextually and institutionally. Sergey, sorry for interrupting you. It's great. I, I met Gerard Mertier uh, before his uh, uh, passing. He was talking about the Real Theatre in Madrid, uh, and he said, I have this uh, very easy um, utopian idea that requires a cement box of, for an opera theater. And I can only work with the, uh, a single space uh, to get to this utopian idea. I will stage uh, a Rossini, I'll make money, and this money I invest into my utopian project. Uh, and there are a lot of amazing operas so that you can't do in the Italian setting, in the Italian theater, with the Italian stage. Uh, like Nonna Prometeo, this amazing opera, which was uh, written specifically for the uh, setting built by Resin Piano, requires uh, church acoustics. Uh, La Chacantas' opera, it would be impossible, inconceivable in the traditional scenic theater because it requires uh, being closer to the choir, this uh, feeling of presence that you would get. Uh, it's impossible to achieve if the choir is far away from the audience, so they have to be close. So there are a lot of projects uh, that require this uh, a different space, an invented space, a design space. And then it's up to the director of the theater in terms of how they're going to go about that, making it happen. It could be like a library, whatever. It could be anywhere. Yulia, OK. OK. Talking about the future. Would I be correct in assuming that uh, the future and the development of the music theater uh, as uh, an interdisciplinary dimension or within dramatic uh, musical theaters uh, um, is not only tied to the ideas of the composer, but also the possibility of uh, collaborations uh, with uh, conductors, with performance, with musicians uh, that uh, would be willing to engage in experiments uh, well prepared uh, and directors as well. Are we going to see new Russian directors emerge uh, uh, in the musical space, uh, like this counter movement? Uh, are you waiting for it? Are you expecting it as composers? Is that something you would be looking forward to? So, okay, colleagues, I don't know. Go ahead. Alexander, well, in my experience, well, rather of an observer, what I'm seeing now is uh, like with the uh, uh, Borussia Kananov, he has his workshops uh, where he uh, teaches uh, directors up to 100 people at a time, sometimes uh, 100 directors. Uh, and uh, these people that have had experience uh, interacting between the theater and advanced uh, music scenes, and they're not going to stop there, of course. They are going to be moving in this direction. They're going to seduce composers, uh, all of this uh, mutual synergies. Uh, this, it's up to 150 people now that have had this taste of uh, new possibilities, new, well, not even possibilities, not opportunities, but this aroma of uh, like this type of theater that to them seems uh, contemporary and relevant and the type of music that uh, they will have had access to and they understand that that's uh, a great means of expression. So we just need to wait for them to find the space uh, in the theatre production space um, and wait for their project. Um, they will be actively engaged, of course, uh, they have no choice. Uh, 
but we need uh, for music uh, spaces uh, to somehow be welcoming. We don't know what's going to happen in six months, uh, but uh, right now it looks like we'll see some active development uh, of uh, online um, joints, uh, like this this hybrid offline online languages, if you will, uh, with the pandemic lockdowns, uh, particularly across Europe. If this continues, uh, our orchestras uh, will be over Zoom performing from homes, uh, uh, and uh, performers and uh, singers will need to develop new types of languages. Uh, to too large degree. Sergey, you don't agree? Sergey, I don't agree. The, the scenic limitations of when we're working in Zurich, uh, with the orchestra and the choir in a, in a separate building, uh, we need to have a, a really powerful cable to make sure that we can transmit a video and sound in zoom there's so many limitations you can't perform live over zoom because there's always a delay in sound and that's not something that we can overcome it's like a simulation uh, it's uh, it's not the real thing and uh, at this point uh, uh, the, the key format now, even during the lockdown in Europe, where we have a very severe lockdown now, uh, is streaming. Streaming is uh, the only way to do it. So, uh, concerts uh, uh, happen without uh, the audience uh, present, but the musicians are there, and then there is uh, the, the performance is streamed. Uh, the audience doesn't come to the theater, they come to the screen. Uh, that's the compromise that we've achieved. Uh, and there is other experimental projects currently happening in Europe. Uh, when you have uh, people in, in the supermarkets or you, 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 in churches or everywhere, but not in theaters, uh, in, in Germany, people are starting to understand that it's absurd. So, Alexei, can I say something? I think that the future of uh, contemporary scenic art uh, is uh, going to develop into parallel uh, avenues. Uh, number one, uh, Sergei was mentioning the, um, the problem of communication with the pandemic. Uh, oh, how to ensure that there's no delay in sound. I'm not going to give you any details on uh, uh, my project. Uh, it's uh, currently been discussed. It's, it's a complex project uh, for an orchestra and uh, nine ensembles that are not in the same space uh, that are very far removed uh, from each other. And problem number one is the technical aspect uh, how to make sure that there is no sound delay. And this is something that we're working with. We've got so like uh, huge program companies engaged and they told me that uh, potentially we would make uh, even a technical breakthrough. The theater will be developing towards new technical breakthroughs, new inventions in this area. And number two, He's talking about these interactions between the conductors, uh, the, um, the the directors and the composers. Uh, I think the roles are going to be blurred, like Kansas is uh, very significant, uh, very exemplary in, in this respect. Uh, I think it's a collective opera. I can't say I'm the one who also did uh, the director, the, 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 the composer, the the, the, the designer, the, I can't say whose role was more critical. Uh, Theodore, going back to the role of the conductor, he's not just a conductor, uh, he, he's a co-author, a co-creator, he's a dramatic actor at the same time. And the further down, the, the more blurred, I think these boundaries between the roles are going to become. Yulia, well, Getting ready to wrap up uh, with our discussion today, I think uh, there's a very interesting question that we've just received uh, in the chat, uh, and uh, I think uh, it will help us uh, talk about the past a bit more and about the future as well. And uh, 
what about uh, dramaturgy in uh, contemporary music? Uh, I mean, the music that tells stories. And what about the melody in music? Uh, it's a question talking about only music, not theater. But I think we could uh, develop it a bit further in the sense that, uh, well, is uh, today's uh, theater a space for telling stories? Uh, or, or is it a place for singing melodies? Uh, what do you think? What does the uh, contemporary uh, composer scene think about this? Um, Sergey, we should have asked Kulansky. He's got a lot of melodies. Uh, Yulia, well, I guess that's his spirit uh, joining us now. Sorry, par parasomnia. I think it's like a, it's 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 a melodic uh, staging. Uh, dramaturgy is working with time. That's present in any piece of music, uh, even it's entirely linear and uh, static. You're still working with time. We're still living through time, and the composer always has to take that into account. So you're always working with the time. So there's no there's no way around. Yulia, and theater is not only telling stories. So it's also working with the, the temporal parameters as well. It can tell stories, it, it doesn't have to, but you're still working with time. Alexander? Uh, well, if you have uh, two elements uh, between which there is some kind of interaction, it's, still, it's drama either way. It's like speaking a different um, language. Uh, it's like you're translating music into a different language. The dramaturgy is the second like side of the same coin, I, I, as far as I understand. Strictly speaking, if we, we talk about dramatic art per se, there's nothing bad with melodies. Uh, I, I, I came up with a book of first. Uh, for me, it would be strange for me to say, well, melody is not something that's relevant anymore. Melodies uh, can come. They don't have to. They might never come. It's not a crime to use melodies. The question is what... How, how is that supported? How is that justified? And the performance itself, but there's nothing bad in melodies themselves. You know, narrative uh, theaters, music that's sung, do they have any future with the new Russian theater? Alexei, I use a lot of melodies. So I have uh, an opera which is entirely built on melodies uh, and uh, coming home and uh, multiple projects uh, when a composer makes an attempt to self-reflect it's important to well a melody to me is an attempt to, to explore what's beyond beyond it um, What if a melody is uh, endless? Uh, how does that evolve uh, or how can it transform over time? To me, a melody is not a theme, it's not a topic, it's not a narrative, it's one of the uh, invitations to think about what's behind it. Uh, and the last question, perhaps to all three of you, to all three characters of our talk today, for contemporary professional composers are so working in a theater. Is this like a, a way to get, uh, is it a hobby? Is it a way to earn some extra money? So what's more interesting, working in theater or working on uh, uh, composing uh, for uh, instrumental or instrumental vocal groups uh, outside the theater? So essentially why do composers need the theater? Like say, well, okay, you know that um, instrumental theater is a genre now, like uh, philharmonic uh, uh, concert halls uh, very often rely on this type of interaction with the audience uh, when uh, 
instrumental musicians uh, suddenly become actors, uh, uh, they are transposed. Uh, it, it reflects uh, this type of perception, this contemporary type of perceptions of both uh, of the theatre spaces and uh, musical spaces. Uh, and very often in the theatre, when there's barely any action and everything is done through sound, uh, that's often the case. And sometimes concert halls uh, turn into performance stages. Sergey, is it a way to make money? You know, working in the theatre and working uh, with uh, like uh, contemporary music groups uh, outside the theatre. So yeah, I just love the theatre. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had uh, uh, 15 projects uh, with the theatre. I work with a limited number of directors, two, three people that I work with over and over. But uh, what excites me is working with the bigger forms, uh, with bigger formats. Uh, uh, like uh, sometimes performances that are three and a half hours. Uh, uh, sometimes you could have 30 hours in other theaters, uh, but uh, I know to them three and a half, a half hours is penis. But this access to bigger formats of so working with dramatic situations, uh, that's what attracts me. And inventing, inventing what music is all about every time. It keeps me on my toes. It's a challenge. Uh, Plus, it's a, it's a field for experiments. Uh, I worked with uh, three orchestras, uh, uh, things that I tried in the theater. I was then able to shift to the opera. In my opera, there are three spatially divided uh, uh, sound layers. Uh, so theater is an experimental platform, and uh, things we can then take on to more perhaps serious forms of art. Uh, I, I love working with the theatre, and uh, and this is a day to day. A theatre is a place to be in a space that you would have never found yourself in before, uh, uh, otherwise. So, like in Novosibirsk or Krasnoyarsk, Omsk, I was going to go to Norilsk, but I just had no time, unfortunately. And uh, I would love to work and be on the polar circle as well. It's 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 an opportunity to step into this cold waters uh, to find yourself in a completely different context. Uh, the first theatre project I had was Comedy de Genève, and uh, uh, in French. Uh, uh, luckily, the, the, the director spoke a bit of uh, German, so we were able to find a common language. But this uh, working with a space that you you feel like you don't know how to do, and you have to. Um, train on on the go it's a fantastic experiment that prepares you for pr projects with absolute music um, apologies for saying that so really for a theater composer when you find yourself in a situation of absolute music uh, beyond uh, um, scenic goals uh, beyond the scenic space uh, uh, beyond the scenic uh, uh, drama to you is that a dream is that a challenge uh, uh, is it something that you're not interested in whatsoever? What is it to you? Alexander, I'm in this situation at least on a once a month basis. Uh, I mm, do uh, electronic uh, experimental music, uh, and to me, it's a stable experience. I do two hour sets so with my. Uh, companion would do it at least once a month uh, usually more often it's not an orchestra that we have like a, a eight or four channel sound uh, but in terms of the amount of information this is comparable to an orchestra and perhaps even several orchestras um, in this sense i wouldn't give either up Working in the theater is a slightly different experience. It is very interesting. It's interesting that you can uh, work through these collisions between things that you've done and uh, what you have was done by someone else. And sometimes uh, the, the collisions can be very unexpected. And uh, this is possible in the theater where you have another part that's done by someone else. But when the two merge, uh, you come up with something that's really unexpected, this uh, unexpected effect. Uh, 
and uh, having understood uh, how that works, you can work it as a new language. It's very interesting. In terms of making money, well, well, what are you talking about? The theater is never about money. Either you make peanuts or you make nothing, or it's just, well, peanuts, we make peanuts. It depends, you can get lucky. Alex said, well, I don't think you can get that lucky. Yulia, I didn't mean the amount of money you're making. I just meant a situation whereby, like, your, your commissions uh, for new music uh, comes uh, from, uh, like, concert institutions or festivals or academic music. They're, they're very rare, if, if any, like, very, very, very rarely. Am I right? Alexander, when you work for theatre projects, uh, monetary compensation is never comparable with the time and the effort that you put in. Uh, it's not even a factor. Sergey, well, it depends. It really depends. Uh, Alexander, well, I'm, I'm judging by my own experience. I don't know. Sergey, well, it depends on how you are able to present yourself. So. Yulia, okay. So, dear colleagues, uh, dear participants, uh, I guess at this uh, we are going to wrap up uh, our talk today. Well, like with it, with a comma, perhaps uh, not a full stop yet uh, in terms of the history and the evolution of the music theatre and drama theatre. I think we've uh, talked about how music has entered uh, contemporary drama theatre. We talked about all of the adjacent spaces. Uh, we talked about uh, through all of the proofs of concept. Uh, we remembered about the fact that it's not just music enriching theater, but uh, music uh, is based on theater itself. It's theatrical by nature. And uh, perhaps uh, that's uh, something new. And uh, this will definitely change the theater landscape. Uh, not just uh, theater technologies, but uh, perhaps even change technologies. We're talking about technological breakthroughs today that are going to shape our lives. So these are the prospects ahead. Uh, I would like to really thank our participants. Uh, we have Alexander Velosov, uh, Sergei Nevsky, Alexei uh, Sumak, and uh, we are going to continue talking about this. At this, I would like to pass the floor to the organizers of uh, the Russian case uh, talks uh, tomorrow. Tamara, I would also like to thank, on behalf of the, the name of the organizers of Russian Case, all of our participants, uh, and uh, on behalf of all of our guests, uh, we had the numerous uh, guests uh, tuning in. We are not going to say goodbye to those uh, joining. We're going to say goodbye to those uh, joining us over Facebook and YouTube, but we're not saying uh, goodbye to our international guests uh, uh, that are going to have the opportunity to join us uh, here. Uh, and uh, they are going to have the chance to ask questions, uh, perhaps questions that haven't been asked uh, in the chat, or perhaps if you're not satisfied with the answers, or perhaps you just want to thank you. So again, thank you, uh, everybody. I thank you all of the participants and we're not